So hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming. So I'm going to talk about two things. Uh, one is this uh, skeleton analysis library, and I'll tell you what that's all about. Um, and I'll try to be brief there, because I mostly want to talk about how I tried to get more and more out of number uh, in developing this library. Um, and so if you're going to take a snapshot, take a snapshot of that. Um, the first link is the documentation for scan. Second link is uh, these slides and the notebooks that I'm going to talk about. And the third link is the um, journal article, uh, which is a biology article, but we would love it if you use scan that you cite that. All right. Um, so I'm going to talk about what skeleton analysis is and uh, a brief overview of the API of scan. Um, by the way, I, I really wish I'd called it Psychid Skeleton, and then it would be SKSK, but <laughs> that ship is sailed now. Um, then I'll talk a bit about what number is, which um, if I'd given this talk last year when I first intended to give it, it would have been more useful than this year where there's like 17 number talks. Um, and then uh, hopefully that will be unique to my talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, all of my adventures trying to squeeze more out of it um, with the help of the number team, uh, which is amazing. They're so helpful. Um, so because I tend to forget acknowledgments at the end of the talk, I'm just giving them up, up front. So um, yeah, Anaconda for supporting all of the open source work that they do, um, including in particular number um, and all the number developers um, whom I've sat with at sprints and have sat on calls with uh, while trying to do this stuff. Um, and then David Liu and Anton Malikov from Intel, um, whom I met at the conference last year and who also helped me out um, with this stuff. OK. Um, so this is just a picture of the scan documentation. Um, we actually have uh, reasonable docs because we submitted the paper um, and the reviewers were like, where the hell are the docs? If the authors think that I'm going to go browsing through the source code to figure out how to use it, they're sorely mistaken. Um, <laughs> And it was, it was totally fair enough. Um, I, I'm pretty glad with the, those comments. Um, and yeah, so we, that's where that comes from. So that's the paper. Um, so let's get started with some um, API discussions. Uh, so this is mostly lifted from the docs, um, but I'll do it uh, a bit more interactively. Um, so the docs come with like four example files. We're just going to read one of those. Um, and we're going to use map.lib in the notebook to look at stuff. Um, so this is the kind of stuff that um, we were looking at um, with skeleton analysis. So this is the inside of a red blood cell. Uh, and it turns out that they have this shape because they have this uh, cytoskeleton um, of a protein called spectrin. Um, and um, yeah, what, we, what we're interested in, it turns out that when you get infected with malaria, this cytoskeleton gets modified, and then your red blood, uh, red blood cell changes shape and rigidity, and that affects whether your immune system can detect the malaria parasite or not. Um, so we wanted to measure the branches between all of the little common junction points here. Um, and it had been done in the past, um, typically manually, um, so we wanted to write an automated tool to do this. Um, so the other thing I want to say is um, ImageIO has some nice metadata um, uh, reading capabilities, so we can actually get the dimensions in real coordinates um, by getting the uh, nanometer measurements uh, per pixel in the file. Um, and so, and scan is fully aware of these things. You can give it a spacing uh, in whatever unit you want, and then you will get your measurements in those units uh, out of scan. Okay, so um, the first thing we do is we binarize that image. Um, so, say foreground and background. Um, and I'll talk a little bit, that's the thing that I'm going to talk about uh, doing in number. Um, then we skeletonize. Uh, and uh, with some functions that I wrote on top of map.lib, um, you can overlay the skeleton on top of the original image. So you can see this is, this, these are now the branches that we're going to be measuring um, using scan. Okay. Um, 
So the first point that I want to make in this talk is about API design. Um, so there's this adage from the functional programming community, uh, which I really like, is that uh, I'd rather have 100 functions on a simple data structure than 10 functions on 10 data structures. Um, and that's really good advice, and that's the reason why um, NumPy is so powerful, because everyone just speaks NumPy and, uh, in, in the SciPy community. And as long as your data structure is somehow numpified, then um, you've, you've just got enormous tools of your, at your disposal. Because if you start having a complex class hierarchy, it's a little bit harder. Um, so I kind of took that too far with scan, and you can see it here. Um, my, my first uh, attempt at an API was this skeleton to CS graph um, function. Um, and what it returns is this pixel graph, which tells me which pixels are connected to which other pixels. So it, it builds a network out of uh, these, these branches. Um, coordinates, which tells me for every pixel in this graph, where is it located in real space. Um, and degrees, um, which is the number of pixels that it's connected to, because that tells us whether a pixel is part of a path, because it would have degree two, only one neighbor to each side, or part of a junction, or part of a tip. Um, and these are all things that you're interested in if you're looking at the topology of the skeleton. Um, so yeah, it's a bit messy. So these are all nice, very basic data structures. The graph is a SciPy sparse matrix. Um, coordinates is a NumPy array of a number of pixels by um, the dimension of your space. Um, and degrees is a NumPy array uh, of the same size as your original image. Um, and um, just to show, so you can do this uh, without a spacing, and then your spacing will be implicitly one, or you can add your spacing in nanometers and then get your um, physical measurements. Um, so I'll just show you, oh, what did I do? Um, this is just an illustration of uh, what SCAN is doing. Um, so this is the graph that it builds out of this very tiny skeleton. Um, and one of the cute things it does is it collapses. Sometimes skeletons can't be simplified, but you, you still, you know, each of these nodes has degree three, because it has this, this neighbor, this neighbor, and that neighbor. So it collapses them into a single node and takes the centroid. Um, so you can get kind of pixel perfect measurements uh, with scan. Um, I also forgot to say, please stop me with questions throughout. Um, I, I like to be interactive in my talks. Um, oh, now what did I do? This is what happens when you modify notebooks too late. Hmm. Oh, branch data is down here. Sorry. Um, we'll go back up to that cell. Um, so once you've got that graph, uh, what you want to do is you want to traverse it. Um, so you want to go from this little point to this little point um, and measure the total length of that. Um, and you might also want to collect statistics about the pixel intensities under that uh, branch. And those statistics are useful for later trimming, removing branches, and so on. Um, so, um, and I'm moving way too far forward. These are the statistics that I'm talking about. We'll come back to this. Um, OK. So this is what this uh, summarize function does. Um, so for uh, every skeleton, right, because you can have multiple connected components, so it tells me which skeleton a branch comes from, the ID of the source, the ID of the destination, so they're the pixels that uh, are connected by this path, the total distance, um, the type, which you can read more about in the docs what that means, um, and then the source uh, in image coordinates, the source um, in real coordinates, um, and the Euclidean distance, so how, how far away those, those two pixels are. Um, and that's handy if you want to measure something about the tortuosity of your pathway. OK. Um, and in this case, so the types are, um, if I remember correctly, uh, this is a tip. Um, this is, no, I don't remember correctly. Sorry, 
It's in the docs. <laughs> um, okay. And so you can draw then um, with some with whatever measurement you're interested in. You can overlay a skeleton um, using um, color mapping the edges, um, and you can also do the same thing um, with the new skeleton class um, with a full Euclidean graph. Um, so, yeah, that's sorry, not Euclidean, uh, a graph that actually. Um, follows the edges, so I'll show you what that looks like if you zoom in. So again, this is all based on uh, matplotlib and is using uh, a line collection to be performant here instead of drawing lots of little lines. Um, so it's, it's pretty, pretty fast. And the other point that I wanted to make is that, again, it was really unwieldy to be lugging around these like uh, CS graph and coordinates uh, and the degrees image all the time. Um, so in the end, I, I gave in and I made a skeleton class um, that um, stores um, these, these three variables. And the main point that I want to make out of that is um, if, you, if you see that you're passing around the same chunk of NumPy arrays together at a, at a time, then you should probably bundle those into a class um, and use them together. Okay, um, so that's how we measured the skeleton in the malaria parasite. Um, other applications, um, so several people in Europe are using SCAN to measure uh, neuron morphologies. Um, the uh, plant CV um, package um, does much the same thing, but they have a pure Python thing, so I haven't gotten in touch with them, but they could probably benefit from um, SCAN. But they, they also measure plant morphology based on uh, skeletons in the same way. Um, and then um, another thing that you might want to know is how long is a river? Um, and a river is, in an image is a two-dimensional thing. Um, but um, by skeletonizing this, you can um, get measurements about it. Um, so this is me thresholding it, um, cleaning it up. Um, so this is all using scikit image. I didn't modify it. This is the straight from the Landsat website. Um, I don't know what kind of, I, it, it is crazy blue, and that's why I, I was able to extract it so easily. Um, <laughs> but um, I don't know why it's that blue. Yeah, um, yeah and so uh, something I didn't know uh, until I tried to do this example is that scan overlay works perfectly well with RGB images. Um, so that's now all of the paths that um, SCAN has found and measured uh, in this river system. Okay, so I'll turn that off. Okay, and these links are over in the website. So now I'll talk a little bit about um, Numba and SCAN. Uh, so how many people here have used Numba? About half the room, maybe a bit more, so that's great. Um, so I'll go quickly over uh, what a just-in-time compiler is. So, um, in Python, this function can, is, is slow, and the reason it's slow is that, you know, there's a processor instruction that takes two integers and adds them together, and so in C, you would say these are two integers, and it would be able to produce that machine instruction, and that would be everything that that function is doing. But this is perfectly valid Python. The a could be a banana, and B could be an apple, and you could add them together. So here's my banana object and my apple object, and when you add them together, you get a fruit salad. <laughs> um, and, oh, what just happened? No, I didn't run that first time. Yeah, so that, that just works. So uh, in Python, um, Python, the interpreter has to constantly be aware of that, that this could be the case, and so it has to make lots of checks about all this stuff. Um, what a just-in-time compiler does is if you call this function with only two integers, it'll say, okay, here's two integers, um, and I know that the result of adding two integers is another integer, so I'm gonna write a little function that does this only for integers, um, and that function will now run really fast. Um, and that's my two-minute introduction to what number does. Um, there is also a number talk uh, later in the conference that probably has a more thorough explanation and more accurate too. Um, <laughs> okay, so 
Um, I'll talk very quickly about what I'm trying to do with, how much time do I have, Stefan? 10 minutes? OK, very quickly. Yeah. Oh, right. Easy. Uh, can people hear me in the back if I? Not great. That's not going to move. Yes. OK, perfect. Thanks. Is this on? Yes. OK, awesome. Um, so um, suppose you want to do a mean filter, or so a, a, moving, a sliding moving average of a linear sequence. Um, so one thing you can do is you can come over here, take this um, average, and take the mean. And then in your output, you replace this with the mean. Then you move it a little bit forward. Uh, sorry, here. You take these, and you compute the mean, um, and so on. Um, this is a pretty slow approach, because um, you're taking the length of your sequence multiplied by the size of your window. Um, in terms of the amount of operations that you need to do. Um, there's a trick, which is um, to compute the cumulative sum, so that uh, you, with, for every element, you take the sum of all the elements before it. Um, and you can do this uh, in linear time, right? You just run through the sequence once. And then to take the mean, you just need to take this value minus this value, and that's the sum of all these elements, and then divide by the length of the window. OK, so that's um, the simple one-dimensional idea. And it turns out that this works equally well in n dimensions. So if you have an image and you want to take a big sliding uh, window mean, you can do the big sliding window, and it takes forever. Or you can compute the integral image, which is a cumulative sum in both directions. So you first cumulative sum this way, and first you cumulative sum this way. And then at this point, I have the sum of every element uh, above and to the left of this. Um, and so to get the sum of all these elements, I can take this value, I can subtract this value, which is like subtracting all this. I can subtract this value, which is like subtracting all this. And then this we've subtracted twice, so we add it back in. So we take. Um, and so this is the same as a convolution with 1 minus 1 minus 1, 1. Um, and the main characteristic is that it's sparse. So actually, if you use um, ndimage.convolve, um, it, it's really slow because it'll take the Fourier transform of this big thing and then do a, a full convolution. Um, so it's actually much faster to write a sparse convolution that does this multiplication for you. Any questions? Yes? So if you're going to do huge, you're going to run into numerical problems? Yes. Um, yes. We're going to skip over that. <laughs> um, I will say there are there are um, there are numerically stable algorithms for the integral image. I will also say that um, the scikit image algorithm is in the middle numerical accuracy category, not the highest one. Okay. All right. So that's what we're doing. Um, so. Um, <clears throat> What I do is um, I compute this. Um, oh, actually, I'm going to say the, the image. Um, so I take the image. I compute the indices uh, of those um, corners. Um, and then I compute offsets in the image space. Um, if I'm in the middle, how, how far do I have to go to get to the next element? Um, and then I pass those to a loop. Um, oh, the other thing is. Sorry. Um, we don't have, um, we end up discarding kind of, if you're, if you're doing a mean filter this size, then this is the total area that you're going to compute the mean filter for. So you, you have a smaller output image than an input image. Um, and you can solve this with padding ahead of time if you need to. OK. All right. Um, so here's the, the loop for all of the indices, which is the indices of that inner cube. Um, for every offset um, in my coordinate and the value at that offset, which is plus 1 or minus 1, um, the output, which is uh, an array of zeros to begin with, um, you get added the input of that offset times the value. OK, is that clear, clear enough? Um, so then we do correlate sparse. Um, 
and this is the, the inner loop. Um, and I've added the number JIT decorator to this. Okay. Um, so I'm just setting up all those variables that I mentioned before. This is a 4,000 by 6,000 image and a kernel size 301. Um, I'm gonna, so the first time that number sees this function, it needs to do a bit of compilation. So I'm gonna run it once just to um, not affect the time it, and now I'm gonna time it. And you can see here, so you can actually, number keeps around um, a little pyfunk of the original function. Uh, and because I didn't want to sit here for a minute and a half, I ran this ahead of time. So it's a minute, 20 seconds, uh, down to half a second. Um, so that's 150-fold uh, speed up. Uh, and at that point, I might have just been like super happy. Um, but um, I sort of looked around. Um, this is inspired by a keynote in 2016. And I'm sorry, I forgot to look up the name. But um, the gist of it was that um, 10 times faster and 100 times faster is not uh, really the measurement you're after. You want to know how much slower are you than the theoretical uh, performance of your processor. Um, so this is the um, number of indices that I'm examining um, and the number of offsets uh, is four. Um, so the number of elements that the, the number of times that I'm going through that loop is uh, those two things combined. And if I divide that by the time it took by um, a million, then that's the number of elements per second that I get. Um, so we're doing 156 million um, uh, runs per second in that loop. Uh, but my clock speed is 1.8 gigahertz, so that's a um, good factor of 10 off my clock speed. And if you look at the inside of the loop, we're not doing that many things. Um, so um, yeah, that just felt like it was a little too slow. Um, it turns out that um, the, the simplest and easiest fi fix that I found was um, that this is actually not optimized for modern processors. So you know, you tend to think of a processor to like grab a value from RAM and then compute on it and then put another value in RAM. But actually, there's a thing called a cache. Um, you, you know, when you're buying, it says with this many megabytes of L1 cache, and you tend to ignore that. Um, it's actually very important. Um, so uh, the reason it's important is that um, reading from the cache is um, orders of magnitude faster than reading from RAM. Um, and so you, um, what the computer does is it optimistically, if you ask for a value in RAM, it optimistically will give you a chunk of those values and move them all together. Um, and so whenever it's much faster to then access the next value than it is to access some arbitrary value. Um, and so that's the reason why I'm printing here the max of offsets. So because my window is so big, um, I'll go back here. Um, so if I access this value first, and then I try to access this value, um, NumPy arrays are stored in all a big line. So I'm jumping this huge distance in RAM, and that takes forever. Um, so you don't want to do that. Um, and it turns out that the easiest thing to do is to um, iterate in the opposite order. So you go through the image, and you take all of the top left corners, and you just sum the whole thing. Then you take all of the top right corners, and you sum the whole thing into the output, and so on. Um, and so if we do this, run it once, run it again, um, that's 133 milliseconds. And that gives me 638 million times through the loop per second. Um, so that's um, good for 4 to 5x um, bigger. When I first ran this, it was 10 times, but I haven't reproduced that since. I don't know if, I don't know what the story is there. OK, any questions about all that? Um, so at that point, I was kind of thinking, so it's 638 million. Um, there's probably you know, three operations in there. So that gets to you know, one operation per, per clock cycle. I'll take that. Um, 
but I still was wondering whether I could, that, that was an accurate way to, to say this is my maximum. Um, so last year I, I talked to um, Stan and I talked to um, the, the folks at Intel to see um, whether I was uh, saturating or not. Um, and it turns out I wasn't even close. Um, <laughs> um, so um, Stuart Archibald pointed me uh, to this inspect ASM method that the uh, compiled function gets, and that lets you look at the actual assembly that number has produced. Uh, not that I can read assembly, um, but um, SD is a um, single instruction, so there's a um, um, it takes uh, a number and it multiplies it or it moves it. Um, PD is a packed instruction, um, and so modern processors can actually, if you say, I have these four numbers and I have, want to multiply them by these four other numbers, kind of like a NumPy vectorized operation, um, the processor can do that in one go. Um, so you can see that there's 19 single instructions in my whole um, uh, assembly and there's zero packed instructions. So uh, number was not able to somehow use, take advantage of those packed instructions, uh, even though it does have that capability. Um, so the first thing, and now I'm producing gibberish because I'm not, um, so, so the, the key here is we wanted to see how much we could speed it up if we reworked the algorithm. Um, so I haven't actually successfully re reworked it. Um, but you can see up here, that we are reading in indices, um, and then we take um, the value off that read in index and add an offset to it, and then read that um, in the output. And so there's no way for number to know that two j's are going to be consecutive. And so there's no way for number to take the two um, j's and, and do compute a packed instruction on them. So I'm going to remove that, and I'm going to change it to just the range. Um, and, and again, I'm producing gibberish. I'm not reading the thing I'm really interested in, but let's just go with it. Um, and so that uh, is another 30% speed up um, already because um, number was able to pack things on. So now we're almost at one gigabit per second. Sorry, one, million, one billion elements per second. Um, and if you look at the instructions, you have some packed instructions um, in the assembly. Um, but I looked at this and I saw that there are only moved instructions. There's no actually addition. The, the addition into the array is not being uh, done uh, in a packed way. Um, and you can, you can kind of, Google is great. And so all I did to do that is just, what the hell does this mean in Google? And that's what it means. Um, so then I thought, OK, well, what if we remove the plus offset here? Um, because again, maybe a number can't figure out that the offset isn't changing between um, subsequent lines of this loop. And now I'm off the reservation. I'm not, I'm not going from the um, advice that I got from the number folks. So um, I could, again, talk to them. <laughs> uh, and they're very friendly and super helpful. Um, and so I tried that. Um, it's about the same. So this looks lower, but it's, it's, it actually comes up the same. Um, but you do see that you have uh, more packed instructions, uh, including addition um, uh, in, the, in the multiplication. Um, so I did wonder whether I was actually um, now being hit by the memory bandwidth. Um, the answer is definitely not. So you can find a C project um, that will actually um, measure your bandwidth. And um, oh. Oh, that's not working. Yeah, so it's about 11. Oh, let me just do that. So it's, it's, I'm an order of magnitude of how fast my processor can read stuff from memory uh, into, um, well, to, to work on it. Um, so that's not the issue. Um, uh, one, one piece of advice that you should uh, take away from this is uh, float32 is actually way faster. So if you can spare the precision, um, here's my, so now this is the accurate version, um, and I'm using float32 instead of, and I've got that 30% gain that I did from packing the instructions together. Um, so 
that's um, again something to to consider. And um, if you do um, float 32 and remove all of those indirection things that we talked about, um, you get to um, yeah 1.5 billion times through a loop per second, which is pretty awesome. Um, and yet you can see again a whole bunch of um, instead of packed double instructions, they're packed single instructions, uh, and that's it. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> all right, we have five minutes for questions. Uh, Ralph. I, I, thanks for the talk, very interesting. Um, I was convinced a long time ago that Numba is quite pleasant to work with and really performant. And I'm wondering, how is your experience as a library author in like shipping code that depends on Numba and uh, you know debugging it when it breaks or when a user submits a bug report or whatever? I, I uh, wish I had that many users that the, the user <laughs> bug reports thing was an issue. Um, now with with uh, you know Numba has uh, wheels on PyPy and uh, PyPI sorry, um, and uh, with Conda I haven't ever had an issue installing Numba, um, and I haven't heard of that either. So again, thanks to the Numba team for making that seamless. Um, the I think the main uh, issue that I've had is that I've relied a lot on their help um, in optimizing things and the tools to. Uh, help people optim them, you know, help themselves um, are not quite there. Um, yeah. Um, I, I also wanted to point out this. Um, the first time I got in, interested in number was in 2016 when I was doing this. Um, well, I, I'd heard about it and I just wanted to try this uh, end body challenge. Uh, it's there's a programming language game uh, benchmark game website and. It has all of these implementations for um, end body um, simulation. Um, and I basically got within 30% of the fastest um, C++ implement, uh, sorry, C implementation at the time uh, with Numba. Again, thanks to the Numba mailing list. <laughs> um, yeah, and so that, that just blew my mind. Now there's uh, some faster ones with C++ and Rust. Um, but if you look at the C++ one, uh, where is it? Nine dot C plus plus. Um, the code looks like that. Um, and with number, you just so so they're doing all of these uh, packed instructions um, that that I was talking about um, manually. And um, I just love that number does that for you. I I don't want to write code like this myself. <laughs> <laughs> and again, I'm glad that people do it, but it's just not for me. <laughs> yes. Oh, hang on. So that's that's really cool. Um, you this, the, most of what you fussed with was the instruction set um, inside the loop. Um, did you ever run into caching problems with the larger images and actually do anything to explore like chunk sizes or anything like that? Um, well, I mean, the there's no caching problem at all in the current. Uh, loop because I'm I'm scanning the the image directly. It doesn't matter how big that image is. Um, I think we can talk later. I don't. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is four thousand by six thousand. Does, does the whole thing fit in cache? The the entire image. Doesn't no, not even remotely. No, sorry. No, and not, not the kernel either. Um, yeah, yeah, let's do that later. Yeah. Uh, excellent talk. Um, in your example, you're, you're doing it in 2D space. Uh, do you have plans? Oh, sorry. So um, my, my unofficial title that I gave myself in Psychic Image is uh, the guardian of the dimensions. <laughs> because, <laughs> because I work in ND, uh, I, I, I work in biology, we have 3D images. Um, so this is all or, uh, or totally ND. Or 4D time-based if, yes. if you, okay. Yes, so this is all ND code. You're right. Um, yeah. Okay, very good. <laughs> <laughs>
So uh, uh, thank you for the talk. So and I, I'm wondering, um, is, is there any possibility to gain some uh, instructions to by like doing multiple things in a loop and then loop less times? Uh, basically, like if, if you if you write specifically that you, you move your i's uh, indices, and then your next line you say that you move your i plus one indices, and mm. then basically you repeat that four times, and then when you when you're looping i, you you loop it in in a in, in a step, step of four. This way, maybe the maybe the JIT will interpret that as uh, four instructions uh, together, and then maybe they can pack stuff together mm. better. Maybe I'll, I'll I. I do intend to uh, pester the devs again on, on the sprints time. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Juan.